Aloha. Hello. Aloha from session three. At oh, secure the dip, yeah, yeah, virtual summer. So this is session three. I'm Sam Styles. This is Daniel Acreage. Uh, we added CCP at the end of our title because Ooh. you just recently got the CCP. We might have gotten it at the same time at the same place. Correct. And uh, you know what? It's it's pass fail, and we both we did really. Passed. We both passed <laughs> <laughs> so, really well. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, used to tell my mom, "D's get degrees," that's and right. I got got that piece of paper. So. Uh, yeah, Daniel Akers here with Sam Styles at Summit 7. So Daniel is the Director of Engagement at Summit 7, and I'm the Vice President of Marketing. Uh, you've probably seen me on fire and, and blowing out stuff and sipping on some refreshes La Azure. La Azure. So today we're going to talk about the CU Island. We are. We're going to talk about starting small with an enclave. Yep. And... Uh, probably debunk some some lies that are out there in the industry around enclaves and what mm -hmm. they can do and what they can't do um but really it's it we're gonna have a good time we're gonna do a demo at the end we are so stick around for the demo daniel's gonna walk us through that but we're gonna talk about cui requirements yep what actually an enclave is mm -hmm. and then we're gonna walk through why you would use an enclave and like i mentioned the demo and then take some of your amazing questions yes we are all right you ready let's kick it off all right let's do it so CUI requirements, lots of logos on the screen. Lots of logos. Yeah. Some of those uh, are enforcing uh, CUI handling requirements or safeguarding requirements. Some are not yet. So what we're going to do is take a little walk down a timeline and kind of pull apart the ones that are and the ones that might in the future. Let's talk okay. about our good friend DFARS. Good, for, good friend DFARS 7012. It's got four major components of it. NIST 171 which everyone is well aware of by this point, 110 controls to be implemented, 320 assessment objectives, cyber incident reporting, so being able to report within 72 hours of discovery of an incident that's taken place, your good friend subcontractor flow down, making sure that your subs are also protecting CUI to the same requirement. And then the last one, which is the one of, honestly, some of the most contention would be the FedRAMP requirement. So FedRAMP being a data center requirement specifically of at least a moderate baseline or what they call moderate equivalency. Uh, one thing to be aware of, and we get this all the time, you know, what is FedRAMP moderate equivalency? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, it's not clearly defined anywhere, including in this DFAR 7012 clause. However, after multiple conversations with the DOD, uh, we finally pulled it out of them saying, you know, something that would pass FedRAMP equi moderate equivalency would be a 3PAO, not a C3PAO, a 3PAO right. coming to assess the NIST 853 moderate FedRAMP baseline, basically, uh, and then attesting that you have met the controls uh, that are required for that. So that would be an equivalency. You don't have to be fully authorized inside of the FedRAMP marketplace, but you do have to have done the work and shown that you've done the work successfully. And then recently in the last few weeks, we've seen DHS come out with a CUI rule. DHS has. So DHS following in some of the same footprints, uh, NIST 171, cyber incident reporting, um, the interesting thing about them is that DOD has a 72 hour, DHS could potentially go all the way down to just a few hours notification, depending on what type of information uh, the incident surrounded, like sensitive personal identifiable information or SPII or PHI, uh, as some, uh, they might also have. So yeah, the last one being subcontractor flow down, nothing too crazy there. Hey, make sure that your subs are protecting the data to the same requirements. One thing you don't see in that is uh, the FedRAMP requirement that hasn't been uh, called out. However, the cyber incident reporting requirement very easily could play in some of the requirements around like the Microsoft GovCloud, mm -hmm. right? That it, it responds to a higher level of uh, cyber incident than the commercial cloud does. Right. So. And I moved a little ahead of you because I got excited. You did. You did. The draft of Rev3, 171 Rev3, yep. recently came out. So this is an interesting document. Public comment, I think, is either about to close or might have just closed. Um, so NIST standard 171 Rev3, when you crack it open, it's, guess what? It's still like 110 controls, right? right? So it's really not much looks like it's been changed. However, what they did was they removed some controls, uh, and they consolidated some, and then they added some new ones. So some of the ones that are the most impactful would be things like application allow listing only. Mm -hmm. So before you had either allow or deny options, um, um, now you can only do allow listing. Yeah, and you recently wrote a blog about the takeaways from the draft of Rev3, mm -hmm. and we'll put a link in the chat to that. You can check it out, but it's, it really highlights a couple different things. And uh, we're getting there. We're going to talk about enclaves, but we're yep. trying to give context for CUI and why we're talking about that, right? That's right. So, all right. 
couple other things. External proxy was added, which is a fun thing. Um, and a lot of other kind of cryptography and encryption possible changes coming down the pipe. Uh, best recommendation, as we say all the time, if you haven't done Rev2, probably don't really look at Rev3 yet. Make sure that you're getting Rev2 underway. Um, you're not going to be missing anything. And again, it's still a draft. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one of the main ones that we like to talk about out of the new Rev3 version, though, however, is the independent assessments. Mm -hmm. So everyone's giving the DoD a hard time with CMMC saying, hey, guys, you got to get an assessment, right? You got to get a third party or an independent assessment to make sure that you're meeting all these requirements uh, at a level two and then potentially a level three status as well uh, with a DIBCAC assessment, right? So NIST said, you know what? Might be a good idea to get someone else outside of somebody in your company to assess how good you've implemented these controls. And so independent assessments would require somebody outside of your organization to come and assess you, not necessarily to um, pass and give you a certification per se, but just to assess where you stand uh, in relation to the implementation that you've done. Right. Uh, then later in the year, 2024, early 2024, uh, they're expected to release the final version mm -hmm. of NIST 800 Rev3. Yep. We don't know exactly when that's gonna take place, um, but we've been told Q1, so it's a pretty safe place to assume. Um, one interesting thing, and we'll see how the DOD handles this, DFAR 7012 calls out that uh, at time of solicitation or award, you have to use the current version of NIST 800 So you might have some contracts coming in after the NIST 800 Rev3 is released, meaning you potentially will have to modify like SPRS, right? Some different uh, scoring that you've done there. We'll wait to see what the DOD does with their assessment methodology and the timing of that requirement. Probably going to be after the Rev3 release. Hurry up and wait. Hurry up and wait. They're good <laughs> at it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, ready? Yep. Let's keep going. Uh, last but not least, we saw a lot of logos, right? Some of those are still represented on this screen. Some are not. Um, the interesting thing here is that there's a, a higher a higher calling, you could say, mm -hmm. of protection of CUI that's going to take place. Uh, the FAR CUI rule, uh, which has been in works for many, many years at this point, uh, the DHS CUI ruling actually mentions it a lot, yeah. saying, hey, guys, it's kind of coming, you know. Uh, this would require a minimum baseline of handling CUI uh, or safeguarding CUI uh, across all agencies in their contracting base. Right. So you can do more, but you can't do less than 171 is basically what this is going to say. And the previous slides we just showed to give you context for what we're going to talk about in saying we're likely not moving away from 171 to protect CUI. That's right. That's what the writing on the wall says. That's right. And right? incident response is something that's also not really changing. We see agencies yeah. adopting different I'm, things. From, so. a, from a takeaway perspective, if there's anything you can take away from this section, yep. right, as we move forward, it's do NIST 800 171, 171. do that, yep. and then also do incident response. Do incident response. In the words of Michael Scott, do you think doing incidents response is cool, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then, uh, you know, write that down, write that down. <laughs> and That's then write important. that down. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. What, one additional kind of fun takeaway, talking about instant response for just a second. Yeah, I'll go back. Uh, the SEC is also looking to release something, get in the game around incident response, mm -hmm. uh, where you'd have to do a disclosure within four business days of like a material cybersecurity incident. So not only are we looking at like federal agencies doing this, but potentially drifting into the overall private sector too. So yeah. make sure you got some stuff underway. Okay. Ready? Yep. Let's do it. All right. Let's, uh, let's, let's get into the islands. Ooh, okay. Talk about CU Island. CU Island. Let's do it. All right. So an enclave. Yep. Part of the CAP, which we studied. We learned this. Quite a bit. Yes, okay. we did. So the official definition of an enclave is a segmentation of an organization's network that is intended, or data, that is intended to wall off that network or database from all other networks or systems. You said you didn't have this as part of your test for I CCP. I didn't have it in mind. I had this one. Okay. So I specifically remember... Oh, I know what that is. Because <laughs> if you remember wall off, it's a good way to think about I can wall off my That's data, right. right? And so from the official documentation, the cap, uh, which is going to get updated as well. Very cool. So, And then Daniel and Sam's definition of an enclave on the left side we have. Uh, the SS Big Acronym. Mm -hmm. uh, great, great boat. Great boat. Yeah. Uh, this is representing the whole company, right? So 
everything that's going on in the company, uh, not handling CUI, yeah. right? A lot of maybe commercial work or other federal work that doesn't involve uh, CUI, maybe just FCI data. Um, and then on the right, we have something called the CU Island. Mm -hmm. So this is something that's going to be a separate, isolated environment where the controlled, unclassified information is going to sit um, away from the SS big acronym because we do not want that CUI to uh, ha have repercussions and impact everybody on that ship. Yeah. So, okay. All right. So specifically, you know, you're on this call and obviously you're either somewhat interested in doing an enclave yep. or you know, hey, this is something we could do. So let's talk about why you would use an enclave. There's some key decision criteria. I think we have nine of these yep, we that we're going to walk through and just give you an idea. You can take these things away of like, okay, can we apply these? So first one being, you know, starting point. That's right. So enclaves are a great place to start. You don't know where all your CUI is. You don't know, you know, how far reaching it might be. However, you do know that you have it and you have the contractual requirement that you need to fulfill. So start with an enclave. That way you have an environment built out that you know is meeting the requirements. And then as you're identifying CUI, you can start either bringing some of those systems into scope or just moving that data directly into the enclave to be worked on. So it's a great starting point. A lot of when you look at NIST standard 171 and DFARS and CMMC, you can get a little paralysis by analysis, right? Oh my gosh, uh, the SS big acronym and their 50 or 100 people, they can't survive all it's these like the controls. Titanic. That's right. <laughs> it's the glacier in the Titanic, yes, right? right. <laughs> and so it's like they can't survive if we implement all this on them. You're, you're right. They probably can't immediately. So building an enclave for just the people that have access or need access to that CUI would be a great kind of first bullet here as a decision. We could call it build a beachhead. Build a beachhead. Going with right. the island thing. I like that. Yeah. So limited CUI. Limited CUI. So again, kind of playing into that first beachhead, if you've identified a handful of users that need access to CUI, why impact the rest of your business? Right. Right. If you can bring those systems over, if you can bring that data over to an enclave environment, uh, I think your users will probably be pretty happy. And one of the biggest, um, I guess, frustrations of you know an IT admin or someone we talk to about doing everything is the frustration of the rest of the company. That's right. I can't do what I need to do. My email's messed up. Like they're not because of the implementation, but right. because, I mean, you're literally disrupted when you talk about doing one thing one way and then completely changing it oh, all. Yeah. When you're migrating everything, uh, email systems, collaboration systems, moving off of some systems because they're not compliant mm -hmm. and the users are very used to that, you know, the classic who moved my cheese. Right. You want to deal with that as an IT person as little as possible, right. right? So doing an enclave and just scoping out those users and systems uh, to start, great spot to start. For sure. Land and expand. So again, as we talked about kind of in the first bullet point, you know, as you're finding uh, CUI in your organization, you have a place to put it. Mm -hmm. Another really good example of this is when you're looking at CMMC certifications, right? Uh, we don't know what contracts those are gonna hit first, the CMMC requirements, but if you go after one, you can now have a place to start taking that CUI from that CMMC contract mm -hmm. into your enclave that's been certified, right? Or it's been assessed and passed successfully. So from there, you can start expanding that enclave to deal with more contracts with that requirement that involve more systems to do the work. And so you can just slowly start building out uh, that environment instead of a bit, what we would call like a big bang approach. Mm -hmm. So. And then undergoing an actual CMMC assessment with the Enclave. Yep. Smaller boundary, right? The tighter the boundary, uh, the, the limited amount of assets and scope of that, the easier, the, the kind of the less complex that assessment's going to actually be. So especially when we're talking about like a virtualized Enclave, which we do a lot of, uh, having those systems in the cloud where Microsoft's housing a lot of that responsibility, uh, that makes your job even easier. Yeah. And then from a cost standpoint, you know, this is an interesting argument, if you want to call it that, it is. right? But you talk to a lot of people about cost. I do. So there's a lot of variables that make that up, right? So cost of the actual implementation and, you know, using that environment. Uh, however, you have to balance that cost with things like, how much revenue am I pulling in from these CUI related contracts, mm -hmm. right? How many users, right, from a cost productivity standpoint is this going to uh, impact, right? Is it 10% or less of my workforce, 5% or less? You know, typically that threshold's about 10% or less uh, that we see Enclaves being a really good initial solution for. If you're a dedicated defense contractor and you've got 50 of 50 employees that do defense work, 
it's going to be probably pretty hard for you to do an enclave. Uh, you can try, uh, but you'll probably end up rather quickly adopting uh, the full organization into scope of that. When we sent an email out, uh, I sent an email to people to sign up for the session. Mm -hmm. It was like, hey, here's what we're going to be talking about. And I got an email response from a guy named Gary. And his email response said, Sam, this is cool. But 90% of our work is for the DOD. Yeah. I'm not coming. And I was yeah. like, thanks, okay. thanks Gary. Like, Appreciate you, This man. isn't for you, yeah, right? Yeah, <laughs> responded and said, this isn't for you, but yeah. yeah. We'll do another session for Gary. Yeah. Um, small CUI footprint, data, users, revenue. Again, we've talked about that a little bit in the last bullet point. You know, making sure that if, if, the, if we can make the footprint small, mm -hmm. because you're not getting maybe a ton of money from defense-related work in this case, you know, you're going to end up saving money in the long term. Yeah. Right? From, you'll have productivity, in that environment, you won't have a productivity hit on your commercial side of your business. Uh, it'll be a low cost of entry. Um, we've actually done some really aggressive pricing for all small businesses, so mm -hmm. happy to talk to you guys about that a little later. Yeah. But the smaller the footprint, easier assessment, easier cost, the whole thing. And you talk to, you know, we can get as far into this as you want to, but higher education universities, right? Huge higher ed. You yep. talk to a lot of higher ed people who, obviously, that's not all they do. Yep. So this is only a small part of it. So it's very applicable, and that's been a, a real-world use case a lot, you know, in the last year. A lot of, like, R1 research institutes are coming saying, guys, we got, like, these grants or these programs we're doing that have CUI, that have ITAR data. You know, what the heck do we do with this? Mm -hmm. How can we enable collaboration while still protecting the data, right, both in the cloud and on-prem? And so we get to work a lot with them. So if you are a higher ed uh, institute out there and you want to hear how we're doing it, feel free to reach out. Yep. All right. We've got three more. So this one is really interesting. So when you're looking at, you know, the DOD and DFARS and something called a CUI asset and what that definition is, it's something that store, process, or transmits controlled and classified information. However, the word access is not in there, right? So the Department of State uh, actually has conversations or has verbiage around the word access or disclosure uh, when it comes to the ability to see unencrypted technical data. So one really unique thing and a really good position for an enclave to be in is if you have non-U.S. persons on your staff, could be on your support team, could be on the MSP that you're working with right now, could be uh, contractors that you're working with, right? could be a wide variety of things. If you have those types of people with administrative or privileged access to see unencrypted technical data, that's a big no-no. Yeah, especially MSP that's outsourced, not yep. the U.S., Big yep. one, a big huge one. Huge one. Yeah. Multinational companies, right? They're not usually doing background checks or, or checking on the citizenship status, right, of their IT staff because they can support them anywhere in the world for the most part. Right. So, you know, if you're an enterprise admin, a domain admin, even a local workstation admin, uh, and that system has ITAR data on it, uh, guess what? And you're not a U.S. person? immediate red flag. We need to look at segmenting those systems and that access away from those people. Great. All right. So joint ventures. Joint ventures also a really good uh, opportunity, right? So if you're looking to get into uh, business with multiple defense contractors or multiple contractors in general, and you want a single place to be able to collaborate in, and you don't want to use necessarily each other's resources, you're spinning up an enclave great opportunity. Uh, and what's really nice about that, at least in the GovCloud space, is that we can segment that cost out into different what they call Azure subscriptions. Mm -hmm. So now we can allocate that cost with chargeback vehicles back to the contract to make it a lot cleaner on what's actually uh, needs to be billed back. Yeah, Microsoft's made a lot of progress in the last couple of years on this specifically. Yeah, they, We'll talk they, about that a little more. We will in yeah. a few slides, yep. Cool. And then subcontractor access. Yep. A lot of people are worried about their supply chain. I can't blame them. Most supply chain uh, companies that I've talked to or companies in the supply chain haven't even uh, started on right. the Stay 171. Yeah. So one of my favorite stories, and I won't go too long on this one, but uh, I was talking to private equity, which is another interesting point uh, to talk about maybe some other time. Talking to a private equity group, they were looking to buy a machine shop. You know, we'll call it Joe's Machine Shop. And they go in and they're doing due diligence and they're checking the place out. And they're like, the guy doing the overall assessment was like, okay, so yeah, where's like the CUI? Like, how are you guys protecting that? He's like, oh, we have a server locked in the attic. That's where we store all of our CUI. Oh, no. That's a real conversation that took place. Oh, so no. um, how great is a contract or, you know, 
the contract's only as good as if you can execute it, right. right? And so a lot of people rely very heavily on subcontractors and their supply chain. So using a virtual desktop or an enclave environment for them to access that data, see that data, potentially even use or collaborate on that data, huge plus. Yeah. All right. Let's keep going. So we've uh, talked about this a little bit in a previous webinar, mm -hmm. but we're going to talk about maybe how you would uh, receive some CUI from a prime. Let's say Raytheon's yep. your prime, mm -hmm. right? They send an email, has CUI or ITAR data yep. in it. We're on the SS big acronym, yep. floating ashore. And what happens? So what's interesting when it comes to receipt of CUI, the people that see it, usually the first, yeah. are BD teams. Right. Right, BD teams, maybe contracts, maybe legal, depending on the process there. Potentially, if you're a small business, your owner might be involved in that. Um, to see if you want to bid on the work or not. So the very first people to see it are typically salespeople. Mm. Um, so when we're starting with an enclave environment, if we're looking for a targeted group of people to start with, we want that BD contracts legal, that early on team that's reviewing and responding with a proposal to some type of work, right? To some right. type of RFP. So uh, we do that using the Microsoft 365 GCC High Cloud. The reason we do that is so we can protect both CUI and export control related data, check both of those boxes. It has all the collaboration services, Exchange and SharePoint and OneDrive, email, all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and it also gives you a virtualized Windows 10 or Windows 11 environment. So you're emulating exactly like what you would do on your desktop, except you're doing it in a secured environment. Right. And then bringing, you know, the rest of the, the SS big acronym uh, into scope later on. Right. That's right. You could end up with something called a bridged enclave, which we have a slide on here shortly. Yep. So why, why use an enclave and... You know, we won't have to go all the way into it, right? but you had a conversation with the DOD CIO. Yeah, so DOD CIO, very friendly mailbox, very friendly people, uh, happy to help and provide clarity. So if you ever have questions, you know, feel free to reach out to them. I have been getting so many mixed reviews around, okay, if I have a computer, in this case, in the SS big acronym, and that computer is accessing this enclave environment with this virtual desktop system, right? Is that physical system on the SS big acronym, is that in scope? Mm -hmm. And typed up a nice email, sent it off to DOD CIO, and they responded with this. If you'd like to see the full email, feel free to reach out. Happy to set up a meeting and review that and some other uh, interesting facts I've gotten from them. But if you look at kind of the, the first line here, assuming the VDI is configured to not allow copying, including screenshots, mm -hmm. which Azure Virtual Desktop does allow, Saving the data on the endpoint or printing the data, except if you're doing it to a NIST 800 compliant system, and multi-factor is to the VDI server, the endpoint would not be in scope. Right. Right. And we see this being practiced in the Army right now. DoD implemented a virtual desktop environment for the Army. Uh, they're treating that very similarly. Um, there are some specific things we have to do to make sure that that connection isn't uh, allowing screenshots, and there's only certain systems you can use to access it that would remain compliant. So we can talk about that during the actual technical demo. Okay. So from a collaboration standpoint, we talked about this a little bit, mm -hmm. but we, we work really hard to make sure that there's cross-tenant access yep. because obviously you start one environment, you have to have the ability to collaborate. That's right. So a lot of people are like, man, if I go in an enclave, I'm just isolated, right? I can't, can't do anything in it. And to some degree, yes, it's kind of the intent to some, <laughs> right, to be able to wall off that information and that data. However, when we're working with very large organizations, they need to be able to collaborate and reach back to the commercial cloud, right? right? That their parent company or that uh, kind of the main organization is in. That could be an academic tenant, a commercial tenant, a GCC tenant. Um, there's this thing called cross-tenant access that's now in play that allows you to do uh, sharing of SharePoint files and OneDrive. Uh, you can do Teams, what they call federated chat, which is one person to one person. There's a new feature coming here in just a second I'll talk about. Uh, and you can collaborate with OneDrive, right? So you can have one identity sitting in the CUI cloud. And then from that, they can access with that single identity, single license, back into the commercial cloud to get access to any like, let's say HR documents they might need or something like that. Right. Now, the new feature coming, and this is somewhat cutting news, okay. right? Uh, supposedly by the end of the month uh, is the ability to do full teams collaboration. Okay. Channels, groups. Interesting. Uh, across these two environments. Now, you see a double-sided arrow there. 
we typically don't recommend commercial being able to access GCC High, but GCC High always being able to access commercial. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we're really excited about the new private preview or what will be public preview for teams coming for cross cloud. Awesome. Okay. So what about bringing in on-prem into scope? Yep, bringing on-prem into scope. So when you're looking at you know some really core functionality like printing, right? Why well, can't print in the cloud? Where would I go get it? Right. right? Microsoft's not letting you in their data center. No, I can tell you that. Not happening. So uh, so what do they actually do? So if I want to bring some of those things into scope, go ahead and go to the next. I have my virtual desktop environment, right? right? I can do a site-to-site -site VPN, so I can connect that environment back to my local network and do, do some logical or physical separation to get to that printer. Um, and let's say I need to bring a computer in scope, right? I'm doing pretty much all my work is CUI related. Mm -hmm. I don't want to jump through a virtual desktop. Right. That's fine. We'll bring your computer into scope as well. And we can use Intune, the same Intune that we're using to manage the virtual desktop. Let's just go ahead and roll it out to your computer as well. So starting with an enclave, this is kind of that land and expand model. Start with the cloud enclave, grow in the other things that you need as you're finding CUI or finding a reason uh, that they would need to be in the enclave. That's great. Mm -hmm. All right, ready to move on? Yep, let's do it. All right. So... Summit 7's managed enclave. Yep. This is uh, new. This is fresh. Yeah, it's exciting. Yeah. So let's talk about why it was created. Yep. And then kind of where it sits in the industry, who it's for, all that stuff. Absolutely. So the managed enclave, we've recently taken a bunch of different projects that we do kind of independently and combined a lot of them to this mm -hmm. managed enclave solution. We found that most organizations need this starting point. They need a stepping stone towards compliance. Right? Maybe they can't uh, pay for a whole company to be compliant yet, but they want some place to start to protect the CUI that they do have. And that's great. That's why we ended up launching this. So this starts as a cloud enclave. So it's using things like the Microsoft 365 government cloud, GCC High, Azure Premium Firewall for networking, data protection with Purview, Microsoft Sentinel for security monitoring, and then identity with Azure AD, now called... Entra? Entra. Entra or Entra? Entra ID? No one knows. Microsoft changed the name. Yeah. Um, Azure AD domain services so we can manage the virtual desktops and then Azure virtual desktop as well. So right. what's nice about the AVD is that you can do just kind of low level Word, Excel, PowerPoint, uh, web browsing task, but you can also get virtual desktops that scale all the way up to support engineering systems. Mm -hmm. So you, there's a wide spectrum of there that we can support, uh, which we love. Yeah. And then, you know, obviously we've been talking about this, but for the Enclave, the SS Big Acronym SS would be Big out acronym. of scope. That's right. The SS Big Acronym would be out of scope. One of the nuances around that uh, out of scope asset, that Windows 10 and Mac uh, device over there, is that those are the only systems that support screen protection. Mm. So when we're talking about being able to leave that system out of scope, we need to be using a remote desktop client on either a Windows 10 or 11 or a Mac system to be able to access the Enclave and nothing else. Yeah. So web browser isn't supported yet. Uh, iOS and Android aren't supported yet for remote desktop capability. Uh, however, you can enroll those devices in Intune and get that data down to them if you need to. And then from a security and compliance standpoint, we build everything to the assessment objectives yep. in NIST 800-171. A, a yep. which is also CMMC level two. So this could hold CUI. And then you see the Cyber AB logo and uh, ITAR. That would have to be GCC high in that case. That's right. So the reason that we put all these logos on here is Summit 7 on the management side, we've built a MSP and MSSP staffed with US persons and with a shared responsibility matrix highlighting all of the controls that are implemented, how we're doing maintenance on them, but then also one of the, the more unique things, a full-blown RACI matrix, right? So you're able to see the responsibility that, that you have as a client that you have to be able to speak to to come in assessment versus what we would have to speak to. We want to make sure that's very clear. We don't want any surprises when an assessment comes along mm -hmm. where you're doing like a mock assessment. We want to be very clear with that, which is what our documentation shows. And you see Guardian and Vigilance, the logo's at the bottom. Yep. So Guardian is our MSP managed services. Mm -hmm. And then Vigilance is our MSSP, which is built on Microsoft MXDR. Yep. Uh, let's see, Incident Response. Gosh, right, I can't we even do, name them we all. We do right? tabletop exercises. Response. We're yeah. all 24 by 7, all staff with U.S. persons. And the SRM is an actual deliverable that we hand you as a client that says, here's what we do. That's right. Here's what you do. Yep. And these are your responsibilities. These are ours. Yep. Very clear, right? And the, the point of the managed enclave is it's built... Uh, it's built on GCC High and Azure government. That's right. And then Guardian and Vigilance are what uh, protect it, manage it. What support it. Right. Exactly. So, all right. 
Ready? I'm ready. Okay. So why use an enclave versus other things out there? Yeah. So there are two types of enclaves, you could call them. Mm -hmm. One is a hosted enclave, Mm -hmm. uh, which is somebody else kind of owning the hardware, owning all of the actual uh, physical or potential software licenses and things like that. Mm -hmm. The other one is a managed enclave. So the hosted enclave has some downfalls. I'll kind of talk about it. We see a lot of people that go with a vendor or go with somebody that has this hosted solution and they end up getting bit a little bit. And you can make up your mind whether or not you think you'd be bit by this, but I wanted to bring some clarity around it. So vendor owns the hardware. It's hard to scale on demand. That's the first bullet there. The reason it's hard to scale on demand is that some of the hosted enclaves don't think that they're a data center. And so there's some language in DFAR 7010, another fun clause to go take a look at, um, where it calls out some of the availability of on-demand resourcing, right? So in order to skirt around that, they're like, you know what? We're not going to do on-demand resourcing. Uh, You have to submit a ticket, and it's going to be a manual process to do. And let's say you win a new contract. That's right. And you need to scale very quickly. Yeah. It's going to take a while. Well, it's going to take a while, and you don't know if they can handle that load. Yeah, right. Because they're doing it in in a private environment versus something like Microsoft, which has data centers all over the United States. Right. Uh, next up, vendor would potentially need to meet FedRAMP moderate or, or equivalency to that. We talked about that a little bit earlier, where on the equivalency side at 3PO, we need to go take a look at the documentation, so forth and so on. Um, if they're claiming to kind of be a SaaS or being some, core, some sort of data center service, uh, that's where that requirement would come into play. It's hard to get your data out if you decide to break up with them. <laughs> Gosh, I have seen this sadly too many times where, you know, your data is in this environment that you're, you're paying a, a user rate or a user fee for it to be in. However, you decide to break up with them. Guess what? It is very hard to get your email out, very hard to get uh, other files and things of that nature out. Um, and I won't name any names, but there's one of these providers that uh, has been disclosed to me that you could actually see other client data uh, in there that wasn't theirs. Mm. So uh, just some real kind of general data concerns around that. Um, Next up, difficult to extend your boundary for on-premise systems. We talked about an enclave is a good place to grow, right? right? Usually it's not the period on the end of the sentence. It's the beginning of the sentence when it comes to your compliance journey. So making sure that you have a solution that can grow with you, really important. Mm -hmm. Last one is non-existent or convoluted share responsibility matrix. Because they're kind of a pseudo not, pseudo yes data center, they're kind of playing that game, a lot of them, uh, right now, you're going to get a little bit of a convoluted answer when it comes to shared responsibility, right? So make sure that whenever you're asking them, if you're looking at a hosted enclave solution, uh, that you're getting that information on the front end or a very clear uh, deadline on when they must give it to you. Yeah. So... Uh, Manage Enclave, so this is what Summit 7 would do. So you would buy the Microsoft GCC High licensing from us. You'd buy the Azure Gov subscription from us. However, it is in your company's name. Right. Right. If something were to happen, guess what? All of your data, all those systems are still there. We're just not supporting the environment anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, So you own the M365 tenant, and it's easy to scale on demand. Because Microsoft is a FedRAMP high environment, they've already checked this FedRAMP, FedRAMP box. They can scale on demand up and down as you need them to. You don't have to submit a, a ticket to a hosted solution and hope that they can buy the hardware to scale you uh, as you scale your employees, right? So that's one big pro. Uh, access to the Microsoft FedRAMP High SSP or System Security Plan. Uh, that's a document that you'll need as a reference uh, going through an assessment. Uh, you always retain access to your data even after support is ended. We already just talked about that. Mm-hmm. Really important. We're not going to hold your data hostage. We can't because it's your data and it's your tenant. Um, easy to extend your boundary for on-premise if needed. We saw that picture earlier with being able to extend to things like printers and other physical systems if you so desire to bring those into scope. Summit 7 and Microsoft GCI supports it with U.S. persons. If you're dealing with ITAR data, right? right export control. We have some uh, clients that are working with UNNPI data, mm-hmm. naval nuclear propulsion information that has even another level of requirements. Uh, making sure that the people staffing and supporting this environment, both at a data center level and at a support level, check all those boxes. Right. A um, couple, couple more. Summit 7 supports 24-7 with our MSP and MSSP. Really good to know. And the bottom one is we do a tailored uh, shared responsibility matrix uh, to the environment uh, paired with that RACI matrix that we talked about earlier as well. That's great. Mm-hmm. Ready? Let's do it. All right. So, demo time. Let's do a demo. Pull it up. All right. 
So we're going to do a little demo here if I can get my screen to work. So um, down here on the bottom, I have this remote desktop environment, right? This little icon here. I have my Windows 10 demo machine. And that demo machine has been set up for us for us to be able to play with and show you guys how it works. So you double click on that, you log in with your own credentials, you know, username and password, you get a multi-factor prompt. And then that gives us our virtual desktop environment. I have to log in because it's timed out on me. This is our virtual desktop environment. Look at that guy. And look at this guy, right? So um, this is our environment where we're gonna have all of this fun CUI. Uh, if you notice, guess what? It looks like my computer. Looks great. Right? Nothing too crazy here. Um, your users will have a very seamless experience in this. Um, they can surf the internet. Um, one of my favorite things, they can play videos. The people don't want to see this. No, they, they don't. They don't want to see this. Uh, you can play videos. You can uh, check the speed, which is always a fun thing to do, right? Oh, okay. A little oh, you're speed, a speed of, of me? me guy. I'm a, I'm a Okla speed test. Uh, I'm a speed of me guy. Mm. Old habits die hard. Yeah, they do. So incredible throughput, incredible bandwidth here in this environment too. So you're not going to have any hindrances in regards to that. Uh, and you can even launch something like a modeling application, right? So here I am moving around just a simple spring model that was a demo uh, here with this e-drawings tool. So you can see that this is all happening in the virtual desktop environment, right? So you can do basic word applications all the way up to work like this. You can scale it even further to do more uh, GPU intensive workloads if you're doing AI work or any kind of simulation work. Um, you can do it. Scale up when you need it, scale back down to a normal size when you're just doing office application stuff. Right, so it's scalable on demand, which is a great benefit of this. But yeah, this is what an enclave looks like. And then whenever you're done, guess what? I minimize that back to my desktop. Love it. That's the end. Very cool. Pretty great, right? Yeah, that's good. Um, so if you'd like to see more kind of demo or talk about this in more detail, our contact information is uh, here on the screen. And then I believe they put our LinkedIn information in chat um, as well as our individual email addresses uh, for any questions. Yeah. You want to do? Uh, you want to do some questions? Let's do some Q and A. All right, let's get into it. Cool. Got a couple from the team here on my phone. Okay. Um, okay. First one: Can I get security logs out of the Enclave to our systems? To our systems. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to restate the question probably a little bit of a different way. Okay. So a lot of you know SS big acronyms, right? If I were to kind of skip back here for our picture's sake, right? A lot of SS big acronyms have security teams and they need to pull those logs in just so that they can see what's going on. They need a level of insight that their company requires. Um, we use Microsoft Sentinel mm -hmm. inside of the Microsoft Gov Cloud. Yep. Uh, however, we can forward logs over to a SIM tool that you might have. Uh, there's something called Azure Lighthouse. However, Azure Lighthouse Commercial, which is like a multi-tenant management, it doesn't cross over to the Gov Cloud. So you can't use any kind of central management per se, but you can do log forwarding if you guys need to be able to see that. And the reason you can do that is because security logs aren't CUI for commercial companies. Right. So. But there are CMMC requirements where you have to reference them, uh, track them, and things of that nature. There are. And we right. would be doing all that as part of vigilance inside of our enclave. Um, this would be just more of like another copy for their security team on the, the SS big acronym to be able to see. Great book. All right. Next one. Who can access this enclave from our company slash MSP? So depending on what type of data you have in it. So it needs to be authorized users. You know, how you deem that's going to be up uh, to your specific company to define. But if you have ITAR information in this environment, uh, it's got to be a U.S. person, mm -hmm. right, to be able to access that information or support that information. Or you need a technical assistance agreement, a TAA, uh, in place for those people to access that specific export control data as part of it. So, you know, U.S. persons are always a safe bet. You know, they, we want to make sure they've gone through training and done all the other controls uh, mentioned in CMMC and NIST. And then, you know, U.S. persons, especially if there's ITAR data in place or you have an agreement stood up uh, where they can access it using a, a TAA, a technical assistance agreement. So Great. Yeah. All right. Next one. So you and I talked about the SRM a little bit. We did. Shared yeah. responsibility matrix. This is a little bit of a loaded question. So okay. you're welcome for this one in advance. What is a good SRM? 
<laughs> what is a good SRM? Define good. Def yeah, that's exactly right. So um, what is a good SRM? I can tell you what a bad SRM is for sure. <laughs> no, so, so a lot of organizations that, that we've seen or a lot of companies that have come to us uh, with a current MSP or with a current you know, partner that they're working with, they'll have a shared responsibility matrix. However, it'll just be to the 110 controls. Mm -hmm. And it'll basically be check marks and saying, yes, we're doing that. No, we're not doing that. Yes, we're doing that. No, we're not doing that. One of the really interesting things about you know, a bad SRM is that typically they're doing way more than an MSP can technically do for you, right? right? It's not possible for an MSP to designate who an authorized user is for your company. You have to designate what an authorized user is for your company and, and then tell the MSP what that's going to be. Yeah, and when an assessor comes on site and says, no, nah, it's not going to fly. That's right. They're using the assessment objectives, not the controls, right? That's right. Or so the practices. That's what makes a good SRM, you could right. say. So uh, share responsibility matrix mapped to the 320 assessment objectives mm -hmm. that have to be met in order to support the 110 controls being met and outlining specific responsibility or that racy matrix that we talked about earlier, that would make up a good SRM. And they clearly define, we do this, you do this. That's right. right. Very clear. Uh, there's a, a pastor that I follow that says, clarity is kindness, mm. and is one of my favorite quotes of all time. If you feel like there's confusion in roles and responsibilities around compliance, you need to look for somebody else that can bring clarity to it. Yeah, it's great. Okay. Uh, another one here. What are your what are your thoughts around HPCs? Define HPC first. HPC high performance compute. Okay. So what are your um, thoughts around them? We talked about um, research organizations before, mm -hmm. uh, higher ed and things like that. So HPC high performance compute are dedicated systems, usually you know heavy on the GPU side, uh, doing really intensive work. Right computations, calculations, all the fancy stuff that I couldn't do uh, to save my own life. Um, those systems are kind of built uniquely. And if you were to put things like antivirus on them, well, you lose the high performance piece potentially, right? And sometimes you can't even deploy stuff like that to those systems. So if they're processing, storing, or transmitting CUI, you're kind of left in a bind, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's technically a CUI asset. However, there hasn't been a lot of clarity around it. So the recommendation that we always give people is, is twofold. One, there's a NIST publication uh, that I'm hoping our team can drop in chat while I'm talking. Uh, it's in draft. They're kind of reviewing it right now around high-performance compute. But also, reach out to the DoD CIO. Tell them the scenario. Tell them what's going on. And ask for their opinion on it, whether you should do with that system. Uh, we've heard some murmurs and rumors around if you have like a jump box getting to the to the HPC, like a virtual desktop or something, there might be some room there to allow that system to, to breathe. Um, but the, the clarity that you need to get, we can't provide. The DODCO has got to provide um, as a, a potential exemption for you. Awesome. All right, let's do two more. Okay. And then we'll, uh, and then we'll close it. Okay. Does an MSP have to be FedRAMP? <laughs> Man, I, I got uh, you today. Live lots, fire here. Lots of loaded ones. Um, does an MSP have to be FedRAMP? So FedRAMP, like we talked about before, uh, usually meant for a data center, mm -hmm. right? So like Microsoft and AWS and Google and all of those things. Um, an MSP usually isn't going to be a data center itself, right? They're more support staff. Uh, that are usually supporting the technology and maybe using uh, software tools in a data center uh, to protect your data or to manage the data, manage the systems. As of right now, the only guidance we have from the CMMC assessment scoping guidance is it has to be able to provide a shared responsibility matrix. Mm -hmm. However, there are murmurs out there saying that your MSPs might have to become FedRAMP moderate. Um, we will not know that until the final ruling when they actually spell that out. Um, which kind of looking at the slides from earlier, you know, that could either happen, you know, later this year or by the end of late next year, um, by the time CMMC starts hitting contracts. But once the OMB has made their decision on when CMMC is going to happen, mm -hmm. we should be able to see the documentation around what the rule is going to be regardless. And at that point, we'll have enough clarity to know, does my MSP have to be FedRAMP moderate or not, or moderate equivalent? Uh, just for reference, if the DOD is listening out there, I'm only aware of one MSSP that's FedRAMP, uh, our good friends at QZARA. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and nobody else. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's not a lot of uh, authorized, we'll say it, authorized federal moderate uh, organizations out there that we're aware of. And it's a pretty heavy lift, um, just to be quite honest. It's great. All right. Can we do pen test using a non-U.S. company for our enclave if it has ITAR data? So it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, right, around access with ITAR and what the Department of State has to say. So if they're able to view, and their goal is to view unencrypted technical data that is ITAR, we need to check the box on U.S. persons. Right. So if their goal as a pen test is to break into C data and prove to you that they got in and the data they saw, uh, it's going to be a safe bet to stay away from organizations uh, that do not staff U.S. persons for those activities. Uh, same thing on the forensic imaging side. So we have this conversation a lot, right? If a cyber incident were to happen, you know, I need to make sure that the people assessing the system and the data are also U.S. persons if there's export control data on there. So my recommendation to you, feel free to reach out to us, but uh, find and talk to forensic image organizations, forensic uh, um, and pen testers, and any other service that you might use annually or once in a blue moon, right, in case something happens, and make sure that you have them uh, queued up and ready to go because finding a U.S. person or finding a company that can support only U.S. persons to execute the job might not be in their wheelhouse. Yeah. It's just going to be important to do. Awesome. Well, Daniel... Thank you. You're welcome. That Thank was you. Awesome. Lots of fun. Yeah. Uh, let's uh, let's jump in our lifeboats and, and get the heck out of that here. That sounds so good. Let's thanks go. Thanks for joining us for session three of Secure the Div Virtual Summer. And uh, stay tuned. We've got one more session coming up. So Enjoy. we'll see you next time. Thank you, guys. Thanks.